Thank you so very much. Uh, good morning, people of God. I say peace to you, to your household, peace to all that you have, peace to America, the country you sojourn, and peace to our beloved nation, Nigeria. I consider it a very great privilege to join you on this occasion of the sixth annual Oluyomi Adewale Foundation Lecture in honor of my friend and brother, architect Oluyomi Adewale of blessed memory. In accepting the invitation, I was reminded of the words of British American author, Christopher Hitchens. He was asked, what do you most value your friends? And Hitchens asked in his memoir, H22, their continued existence, the author concluded. And much as we would have desired the continued presence of architect at Dewali on this side of eternity, it is gratifying that his heartbeat still resounds through the Oluyomi Adewale Foundation years after he returned to his eternal home. I heard earlier on that he was a man who built men and therefore his legacy continued. His continued impact lends credence to the words of Frank Rooney, who said, immortality is a genius to move others long after you yourself have stopped moving. I like to commend the efforts of his wife, Pastor Mrs. Bola Adewale, and children, as well as the board members of the foundation and the leadership team of Cornerstone Christian Ministries New York, who have preserved the legacy of this righteous man. I consider the prayer of Naomi appropriate at this juncture. Naomi said in Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, Blessed is he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. May God bless you all richly as we keep this legacy alive by your generous gift in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I would like to say that I was a direct beneficiary of the gracious genius of Oluyomi Adewale at the University of Lagos in 1978, when as a student of architecture, he took up the challenge to be my campaign manager when I became the first Christian to run for the office of the president of the University of Lagos Student Union government. At a time when the prevailing posture was the seclusion of believers from terrains such as politics due to a fear of mixture and contamination, my friend Oluyomi Adewale designed and organized a creative campaign in support of a politician from the pulpit, as I was called at the time. His voluntary management of my campaign was not only an act of courage, it was also one of faith and friendship. Upon graduating as an architect and driven by his persuasion that a call to serve God must pervade every domain of influence, Oluyomi Adewale will go on as a professor of architecture and mathematics to impact the next generation as he taught at King University and Essex County College in New Jersey, while at the same time imparting lives as a pastor and servant of God, the master architect. This brings me today to the theme of this lecture. Let me begin with master architects in history. Throughout history, we have seen phenomenal edifices emerge from the arts landscapes from living spaces to workspaces, from places of worship to palaces and government buildings, from games and sports, arenas, to event centers and amusement parks, the buildings and structures that dot the landscapes affirm that humanity has carried on the work of creation. However, these magnificent structures were preceded by the conceptual work of a unique class of professionals called the architects. It is why we refer to these magnificent structures as 
architectural masterpieces. The individuals behind these masterpieces are described as master architects. These master architects include the likes of Michelangelo, who designed the dome of St. Basil Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, Augustus Pugin, who designed the interior of the Houses of Parliament, and the Big Ben in London, Louis Henry Sullivan, who modernized American architecture and is known as the father of the skyscraper, I M Pei, who designed the glass Louvre pyramid at the Louvre Museum in Paris, Norman Forster, who designed the Millennium Bridge in London and the London City Hall, Dame Saha Hadid, one of the world's few celebrated female architects who designed the Guangzhou Opera House in China, Frank Gehry, the non-Nigerian architect who designed the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles and has become the model of many young architects, and Frank Lloyd Wright, regarded as a foremost African-American architect who designed Falling Water, a home that sits on a waterfall in Pennsylvania. In Africa, famous architects and their works include Lanre Tori Koka, who was one of the original planners of Nigeria's federal capital territory, Abuja, or Lanjumoke Adenowo, who was designed for global brands, including Coca-Cola, L'Oreal, and Guarantee Trust Bank, and Sir David Ajayi, the Ghanaian British architect who designed the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and was awarded the gold medal of the Royal Institute of British Architecture. Permit me to add to this category Professor Michael Adeloya Debamoa of the University of Lagos, who designed the architectural blueprint of the Citadel, a new phenomenon in church architecture. They and others in their class attained stardom as a result of the star buildings that emerged from their designs. As such, in addition to the phrase master architects, they are referred to as star architects, a portmanteau word for star and architect. Attributes of master architects. Please bear with me as I lay foundation before I introduce God Almighty himself. There are certain core attributes possessed by every master architect, and these include the following. Number one, vision. The ability to first crystallize the essence of a structure before its creation. Number two, immersion. The ability to gain a full grasp of the spirit of the prevailing civilization or age and to interpret it in their work. Number three, discernment the ability to decode the needs and aspirations of the client. Number four, disruption. The ability to transcend the prevailing spirit of the prevailing civilization or age, challenge the status quo, and chart a new course in culture and civilization. Number five, communication. The ability to explain the essence and features of their work in a clear enough manner to facilitate execution and command appreciation of its value. And number six, collaboration. The ability to work with clients, fellow architects, builders, artisans, and a wide array of stakeholders to ensure the realization of the vision. The relationship between the architect and the builder is worth emphasizing because for every architectural blueprint to be translated to reality, the master architect as a draftsman must work collaboratively with the craftsman, the builder. And then number seven, design. The ability to combine art and science to produce executable blueprints to the appropriate scale. To buttress these attributes, consider the submission of architect Jumoke Adenowo in describing the essence of architecture beyond buildings. During a BBC Business Africa special, she said, architecture is deep. It is about life. Architecture is about national identity. Architecture is about legacy. It's about immortality. It's about man's quest to live forever. Architecture is not just about function. It's about the same gaze, the spirit of the age. So there is a lot more to architecture than housing, 
or buildings. It's about who we are as a people and how we define ourselves at this time. In this statement, Africa star architect, as CNN described her, echoed the philosophy of Augustus Welby Pugin, who believed that good architecture is the result of good society. And driven by this philosophy, Pugin had a vision of architecture as a moral force, a force for good, to transform the prevailing decadent society that was reflective of the government of King George. This brings us to the call to build again. I am reminded of the symbolism of the citadel, the complex that houses the church where I serve as overseer. Beyond being a new phenomenon in church architecture, is a forerunner model of the new Nigeria. And I would like to quote a portion of the address I presented on the occasion of the fundraiser for the Citadel on September 3, 2016. In many ways, if not in all the story, in many ways, if not in all, the story of the Citadel is Nigeria's story. It is not the story of a lone individual, lone building, or lone congregation. Is a symbol of a new way, a new people, and a foretaste of the new Nigeria. The citadel will point to what is possible on the African continent, what can happen when we remember that our humanity comes in different colors and creeds, but is fundamentally the same, and what we can make of the raw material of setbacks to begin to build again. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, to build again is a call to every nation builder whose nation lies in rubbles as did Jerusalem when Nehemiah heeded the call of destiny. To build again is a call to every Nigerian who is grieved by the state of our nation and longs for the emergence of the new Nigeria. To build again is a call to every reformer who is challenged by the decay across institutions from the family to the nation be it in the Western world or in the third world. To build again is a challenge to every individual who is confronted with the tragedy of failed dreams. To build again was what the master architect did at creation when he achieved the greatest architectural feat in the history of this side of eternity as he rebuilt a breathtaking edifice, planet Earth. To understand our mandate to build again, let us at this juncture visit the design studio of God, the master architect himself. A partial tour of the design studio of the master architect. In the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, we are introduced to God as a creator of the heavens and the earth. However, by the second verse, we read of a chaotic earth that had become formless, empty, and covered by darkness. This was not originally so. Isaiah 45, verse number 18, reveals that God did not create the earth to be an empty wasteland in the New Living Translation. It reads, and I quote, For the Lord is God, and he created the heavens and the earth, and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be a place of empty cares. I am the Lord, he says, and there is no order. Dear friends, the chaos in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 was evidently not by design, but the result of the fall of Satan following his rebellion against God in Revelation chapter 12 from verse 7 to 9. To nine. We learn that war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. There was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. We then see the Spirit of God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, brooding over this chaotic mass. And to translate this phenomenal error in architectural design for a contemporary understanding, I want you to picture in your mind Daniel Leibskind or David Chills, the architects, architects commissioned to design the buildings that will replace 
the World Trade Center after the Twin Towers were destroyed in the September 11 attacks. Picture them brooding over ground zero, the site of the falling buildings, and conceiving the designs of the new buildings that will replace the Twin Towers. As God brooded over the chaotic earth, the Holy Spirit incubated the architectural blueprint of the earth and set the stage for the rebuilding process. As we produce through this Genesis creation account, as well as several supporting texts across scripture, we see God Almighty, the master architect, demonstrating all the attributes of great architects that I listed earlier, and much more beyond what any man can conceptualize or can bring to birth. Let's consider the seven things I mentioned earlier. Number one is vision. As the Holy Spirit was brooding over the earth, we see in action the God who not only knows the future, the God who caused those things which be not as though they were because it has a clear picture of the preferred future. Number two, immersion. God in designing the earth did not do so far removed from the prevailing situation of the earth at the time. Instead, the Holy Spirit interfaced with the chaotic earth by brooding or overing over the waters. Number three, discernment. In the creation process, God himself was a client and the service provider because not only was the earth created by him, it was created for him. You find that in Revelation 4, 11, created everything for his own pleasure. Nevertheless, although he created the earth for himself, his intention was to have living creatures inhabiting the earth with man having full custody over the earth as his region. Hence, God, in his architectural blueprint, made provision for the needs of all living creatures and for the needs and aspiration of man, including those needs and aspirations that man had not even realized he heard. Let's come to number four, disruption. Although God interfaced with a chaotic earth that had lost sync with his purpose, the master architect did not settle for the chaos. Instead, out of the chaos, he caused to emerge a culture of order, thus charting a new curse in civilization. As you hear me today, I don't care what disorder is going in your life. I don't care how the winds are blowing against you. And I don't care what fierce storms are raging against your house. In the name of Jesus Christ, the God who commanded the light to shine out from darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God on the face of Jesus Christ, we move into your situation and bring order into any chaotic disorder you may be facing in the name of Jesus. Number five, communication. Throughout the creation process, we witness the art of communication between the architect and builder, as well as from the architect, architect and builder to the, to the end user man. Hence, we hear conversations among the end and instructions from the end, end to man, such quality communication that will facilitate collaborative execution as well as an understanding of the value of the output. I will explain that in the course of the lecture, that when it was time to make man, it wasn't just God said and God did, God said and God did. A council was called in heaven, the God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They held a meeting in that council and they let us, for the first time you find that us in the Bible, the word U.S., let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. And because God has made you, in the name of Jesus, as you listen to this lecture, any other thing that tries to make you, that tries to disfigure you, will not take place in your life in the name of Jesus because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. He died so that we may live. He became poor so that we become rich. You know the righteousness that Jesus had imparted unto us. The Bible says, even you know sin became sin for us, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. We clearly say every time in the church I pastor, you can win by righteousness. In, in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 12, verse 26, he said, in the, in the way of righteousness, there is life. And in his path, 
There is no death. In the name of Jesus, your hopes and your aspirations will not die. As the legacy of my friend is still living on after he's gone to join the saints triumphant in Jesus' mighty name, God will ensure that you too contributing to his own legacy will have an enduring legacy in Jesus' mighty name. In number six, collaboration. The collaborative dynamic of the Godhead is captured in the phrase, as I said, let us make, let us make man in our own image in Genesis 1.26. Even though human architects may agree to disagree or even descend into unhealthy competition, I'm talking of natural architects who are competing or bidding for a job, they may fight, they may do everything. But the creation process exemplifies perfect harmony and collaboration between the architect and the builder, because unlike human architects, the master architect is a master builder. The draftsman is a craftsman. The father, the son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Beyond this divine collaboration, in God's design studio, we also see the master architect decide to collaborate with his creation by making man in the image and the likeness of the Godhead, giving him dominion and delegating aspects of the word of creation to man. That's why people have what you call geniuses today, and they can do uh, 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 what you call masterpieces. They can create by the grace of God, especially those who are believers, because witty inventions is part of what God has promised to give to us. Now, design number seven, the must design expertise of God, the master architect, is seen in the logical and precise order of creation. From the wonders of Eden and its ecosystems to the fearfully and wonderfully fashioned intricacies of the human body. My God, I'm sure your grace on 139, he has fearfully and wonderfully made you and every day of your life is set in, in, in motion by him even before they occur. He knows everything about you. He is a master architect. He is a grand organized designer. This is God and his divine imprint of perfection is everywhere evident in the word of God. Let me go to the integrated design, integrated design tool of the master architect. This is where I want you to please pray for yourself, pray for the church, pray for the legacy of my friend that he will continue as God will raise men and women to further the cause for which he lived for. To further appreciate the master architect in his design studio, we need to refer to Proverbs chapter number eight. Here we will observe that unlike the human architect who deploys a variety of sketching tools, whether traditional or digital, the master architect has all his tools in a single integrated platform. It's called wisdom. Wisdom. Through wisdom, the earth is created. In Proverbs 8, 22 to 31, the Bible says, and I quote, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I've been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal doors of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. That's wisdom talking to you. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily, easy light, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited, his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. As you study the full text of Proverbs chapter 8, you will observe that God's design tool is useful no matter the object of his design. From the individual to the family, from the nation to the earth, and from the known to the unknown universe, this same tool is available to us today as God's collaborators 
in the mandate to restore and rebuild the institutions. I want to remind everyone listening to me that when Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into the world to preach the gospel to every nation, he said, make disciples of nations. Not just make disciples in a nation, make disciples of nations. And as I'm speaking, I trust God that it will, you will be awake to righteousness and know that every mountain of influence, mountain of culture, must be taken over by Christians in the name of Jesus as we begin to strategically position and plant us here. I know that we are told that this world is not his own, but he wants all the kingdoms of this world, according to Revelation, they must become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Jomia Dewale lived for this. He went to the nations of the earth. He trained people. He wanted good for everyone. And his legacy must also reflect his aspirations while he was still here. Listen to me attentively. I was in South Africa ministering, and a young lady approached me, a Nigerian. He said, sir, I've been struggling for five, six, eight years now. I want to build a school. I don't have money to build a school. I said, okay, what does it take to build? He said, I need money. I need cement. I need this. He counted it. I said, that's the problem you have. The Bible says it is through wisdom that a house is built. Through understanding, it's established. And through knowledge, all the places in it are fully furnished. When God gives you wisdom, you become creative. And I want to remind everyone listening to me that Jesus had become wisdom for us. And sanctification, and justification, and redemption. That's what he has become for us, and we must excel in every field of endeavor because we have the wisdom of Christ. I pray that you will have the mind of Christ today. Let the mind of Christ be in you. And if you have the mind of Christ, no flies can play on a hot stove. If you have a kitchen, you see flies sometimes play on cold stove. But put fire there. Let wisdom of God, let knowledge and the riches of understanding of God begin to burn like a, a fiery flame. No demon can operate because you have the mind of Christ. This is my challenge to nation builders who are in the image of God, the master architect himself. Let me now zero in on the call to rebuild nations and show how we can deploy the attributes of the master architect to rebuild a nation that currently lies in ruins. I'll take those seven things again. Number one, vision. Our vision for our nation must be propelled by an understanding of God's plan for the nations. In Genesis 12, 2, God lays out his vision for the nation when he calls Abram and said to him, I will make you a great nation. Christians must not fold their hands or else will become a big shame because we are put here to extend the frontiers of God's kingdom in every facet of human society. God will let us say to Abraham, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. In Galatians 3, chapter 7, the Bible says, know that those who are faith are the seed of Abraham. For the scripture foreseen that God will justify the nations Preach the gospel to Abraham saying, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That is the authentic gospel. It was preached by God himself to Abraham in Genesis 3, 7 to 9. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Are we living up to that? Or we are living as packing our suitcase that we are waiting for Jesus to come and then we can escape. If God wants us to escape, the day you are saved, he would have taken you home. He left you here because he wants you to do your bit. My friend Yomi Adewale did his bit. He left his legacy and is continuing now. And I'm challenging you that you must embrace what vision God gave to Abraham. In Acts 17, 26, the NIV version, it is written, From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Therefore, in the midst of our national cares, we must be propelled by God's picture of a preferred future for our beloved nation, Nigeria. 
And for the nation where you live, America, there's a lot of chaos in your own nation too. But Christians as the salt of the earth and as the light of the world must rise to the occasion by saving one here, by saving an institution there, by reaching out and by declaring the authentic gospel without religion. Religion smells. I can't stand it. I can't stand religion. The word religion means return to bondage. That's what it means. Relationship with God is what Christ brought, not religion. Number two, immersion. It says we as nation builders must interface with our nation in its current state, no matter how despicable it is. We must be ready to make contact with our contamination. Daniel did that in Babylon. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's portion of meat or drink and see how God exalted him in a foreign nation. See what Joseph did in Egypt. See what the likes of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach did in their day to let people know that God is alive and he speaks. This is why I continue to urge the Nigerian diaspora to fully identify with Nigeria and actively work towards its transformation. Like Nehemiah, the Nigerian diaspora must embrace brain gain instead of brain drain. We must embrace brain gain strategies as propagated by movements such as Nigerians for Nigeria so that they can be positioned to deploy their resources, talents, and skills to build a new Nigeria. Number three, discernment. As nation builders, we must become like Ezekiel, who sat where the people sat. For this foundation to be thinking of giving scholarship to someone in India is identifying with humanity, no matter where they are, because you never can tell what that doctor will become when he finishes. Ezekiel sat where people sat, which means we must be able to design the needs of the people that we are called to serve and understand the issues that affect them so that we can administer empathic solutions to problems. Here comes number four, disruption. Even as we interface with the present state of our nation across the landscapes, including the social, economic, and political spheres, we must be ready to disrupt the status quo there's no status in status quo. We must be ready to disrupt the status quo and become instrumental in the emergence of the nation of our dreams. Communication. This call to nation building is a call to communicate. As custodians of the vision of a new nation, as the seed of Abraham, blessed along with believing in Abraham, while the majority of our citizens are overwhelmed by the chaos in the nation, it is our responsibility to communicate the picture of the preferred future in a manner clear enough for it to be embraced by the generality of our people so that hope will be restored to our nation and the majority that is wrong today will become the minority while the minority that is right today will become the majority. I know it's a question of time. The majority that is wrong will become the minority. The minority that is right will become the majority is only a question of time. Collaboration. As we embrace the call to rebuild our nation, we must understand our respective roles in this mandate and be ready to collaborate with fellow nation builders so that every joint we supply in building the culture, the structure, and infrastructure dimensions of our nation, we must also deal with intrastructural booby traps that fuel conflicts so that we can unite to build a truly great nation. I believe in my lifetime there will be a new Nigeria for every Nigeria. And you can do the same in your city of Sojourn, in New York, wherever you are. You can make a difference. You can become what is called an oasis of love, of joy, of gladness, of raising children that will be sent into the world to make a difference. Let me round up with design. Number seven, as nation builders, our strategy must be to receive the blueprint from God Almighty, the grand organized designer, and to execute the divine blueprint in our spheres of influence until every facet of our nation and the nations of the earth aligns with the agenda of God. Brothers and sisters, as Abraham's spiritual eyes were elevated to look forward to the city whose architect and builder is God, so were men of all supernaturally endowed and commissioned to execute 
design briefs to God's specifications. Noah received the architectural blueprint of the ark. He was able to save his own household and the rest of creation. Moses received the architectural blueprint of the tabernacle. God filled him with his presence. David received the architectural blueprint of the temple. And when it was completed, Almighty God's presence was felt there that even trumpeters could not dare to stand in his presence. Likewise, we have also received the architectural blueprint of the new Nigeria from God, the master architect. The new Nigeria is a nation that is equitably structured and productively governed. A nation where no one goes to bed hungry and no child is left out of school without access to quality education. We have our homes, schools, streets, villages, highways, and cities are safe and secure. And Nigerians can walk, play, or travel with their minds at rest and go to bed with their hearts at peace. In Nigeria, we have our hospitals and life-saving institutions, and every Nigerian has access to good quality health care. We are no youth is unemployed, and our young men and women are job creators. We have businesses thrive on innovation, and made in Nigeria can compete anywhere in the global market. We are homes and businesses have access to an interrupted power supply, and ideas are facilitated by functional infrastructure and cutting edge technology. We are no part of our nation. East, West, North, or South feels marginalized. And every Nigerian is proud to say, I'm a Nigerian. A nation that is built in line with the design of the master architect. Stop there for a moment and study your Bible. In Deuteronomy 32, the Bible says God gave inheritance to every nation on the earth. There is no nation without inheritance from God. But some of our people have squandered ours. I recall that in 1979, UAE, Dubai, were come, they came to Nigeria to borrow money. Look at what they have become today. You can't say it's religion. Because they're not even Christians there. But in 50 years, they have made such a landmark, a difference that nations were rushing to them. Who says it cannot be done here if people will yield to God and get his own true blueprint for Nigeria? I trust God that this nation will be built in line with the design of the master architect. A home to know it, Nigerians in the diaspora will be glad to return. Oh, I remember the popular song that is built from Psalm 33. When they were in exile, they asked them to sing the Lord's song. And they said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? By the rivers of Babylon where we sat. And then they declared, Lord, if I forget Jerusalem, let my tongue cling to my roof. If I do not remember her constantly in all my doing, I'm challenging you that by the name, by the grace of the living God, you will also come back and contribute your quota. I'm persuaded that the nation, the new Nigeria, will be built in my lifetime and in yours. I want to thank you for listening. God bless you. God bless Cornerstone Christian Ministries. And God bless Oluyomi Adewale Foundation. And I'd like to thank my friend. Pastor Bola uh, Adewale, uh, I recall that in 1978, you were the one who invited me to Deeper Life to be part of that ministry, and I stayed there for five years and gained tremendously. Uh, your life will continue to shine brighter and brighter. Your children will rise above the perversity of their generation and make their mark, and the ministry that God has committed to your hands will flourish. May God Almighty bless you. And may the legacy of my friend continue forever. Thank you for listening. God bless you.